Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight for best-selling author Anthony Amore for a presentation on his new book, his newest book, The Woman Who Stole Vermeer, The True Story of Rose Dugdale and the Roseboro House Art Heist. Uh, Anthony is the Director of Security and Chief Investigator at Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, uh, where, he, where he is charged with the ongoing efforts to recover 13 works of art stolen from the museum back in March of 1990. Uh, additionally, Anthony is the co-author of Stealing Rembrandts, which was a Wall Street Journal bestseller, and he's also the author of The Art of the Con, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he provides analysis on issues related to security and terrorism for the BBC, NBC News, NPR, CNN, Fox, and others. Um, Anthony is a busy guy. I think I even voted for him a few years ago. Uh, he lives uh, here in Boston. And a little bit about the book. Uh, the book uh, tells the extraordinary life and crimes of heiress turned revolutionary Rose Dugdale, who in 1974 became the only woman to pull off a major art heist. Uh, the woman who stole Vermeer is Dugdale's story uh, from her upbringing in Devonshire and her uh, presentation to Elizabeth II as a debutante to her university years and her eventual radical lifestyle. Her life of crime and activism is it turns unbelievable and awe-inspiring and sure to engross readers. Uh, so all, let me see, where are we? 150 of us or so. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Anthony for joining us here tonight. And Anthony, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. That was a, a great introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you everybody who's joining us tonight. Uh, really pleased to be able to speak to so many of you. I, I wanna also thank all 10 libraries, but especially Robert for, for thinking of me and allowing me to talk to you about this book, which uh, was a real labor of love for me. But I just wanna tell you a little bit how I came about the story. Uh, uh, Robert mentioned that I uh, am the investigator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum obviously looking for the pieces that were stolen. And it's been 16 years now, believe it or not, it's hard for me to believe, um, but we're not giving up. So uh, when I first started looking for the Gardner paintings, I had come from Homeland Security, which is a whole different ball of wax. So I needed to really get up to speed on art crime. And I researched all sorts of heists and I've cataloged thousands of heists. And it's what I do, um, researching art theft. And uh, one thing that, that really uh, stood out to me was this heist that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. And one of the reasons that, well, there are two really uh, important reasons why Rose Dugdale always stuck in my mind. Number one, because every time I would read about her, I would hear something different and inconsistent with everything else I had heard about her. And that, that left me uneasy. And number two, whenever I would go about the country or going on TV speaking about art theft, people would invariably ask me, have any women stolen art? And we're talking about big heists like masterpiece thefts and you know the big sweeping crimes. And I would always say, no, it's always men. Like just like every other dastardly thing, it's always men, right? There, but there's always an outlier and serial killers and kidnappers and uh assassins, you name it, it's always that outlier. And in art theft, it's Rose Dugdale. So about uh, 2016, I became frustrated with all the inconsistencies about her life. And I decided, well, it's time for me to dive into her life and learn the definitive story. Because her art theft in 1974, that I'll talk to you about tonight, was the biggest uh, of its time. There had been no bigger art theft before. And when I tell you what she took, I think if you love art, or even if you know about art, you will be flabbergasted to, to hear about this. So let me tell you about Rose Dugdale's story. And I've enjoyed writing it and researching it. I miss it so much because it's this great period story. It takes place basically from the 1950s uh, through the 70s. Rose was uh, born, uh, Bridget Rose Dugdale, to a very prominent family in Devon. They lived uh, in a place called Yardy Farm. That was their country home, this massive estate that you see on you know, these great PBS shows with rolling hills and horses and animals and hunting and uh, house um, staff and every 
luxury that you would imagine from some you know masterpiece show on on PBS and and she just had a great life and she went to the, as young uh, girl she went to Miss Ironside a really exclusive girls school in Chelsea where her family had a beautiful apartment as well her father was a name at Lloyd's um, just uh, an idyllic upbringing. When Rose turned 17 in 1958, things started taking a little bit of a turn for her. She started showing just a bit of a rebellious streak. And what happened was in 1958, the Queen announced that this would be the last year that debutantes would be presented to Queen Elizabeth in person. Um, they felt, she, Queen Elizabeth and her sister both felt it was something that um, people were uh, taking advantage of. They no longer wanted to be subjected to these in, um, introductions. So they announced to the, the um, well-to-do and to all of Britain, obviously, that 1958 would be the last year we held that way. So the stakes were especially high because that was Rose's year to be a debutante which was completely expected of her by her family. Of course, they were high society people. It would be a great embarrassment if Rose didn't participate. And lo and behold, Rose told her parents she had no intention of participating in this meat market. She had no desire to be paraded in front of men uh, as a potential wife. The parents were panicked and they bargained with her. Rose's demand was, I will do this if you allow me to attend Oxford. Again, it's, it's uh, 1958, and it, I love the difference in time, because as a father of two daughters, I could tell you if either of them came to me and said, I want to um, attend Oxford, I wouldn't have to strike a deal with them to allow them to. I would be overjoyed. But back then, the Dugdales didn't want that for their daughter. They wanted her to be um, a socialite and to hobnob with people of her ilk and nobody else. She wasn't allowed to talk to people from the nearby villages where she grew up um, and marry well. But as that was not her intention. Both parties agreed she could go to Oxford. She went to, uh, became a debutante, uh, was introduced to the queen, curtsied, hated it, of course, but got her wish. So she goes out to Oxford and she is not a radical by any means when she's there. However, she does do something that's sort of interesting. At the Oxford Union, um, though, the, though Oxford itself is co-ed, the union is not. And um, no woman is allowed inside. So Rose and the friend decided they were gonna break that glass ceiling and disguise themselves as men and went in and spent time there so that they can establish that women could. And this is a picture of them. There's Rose on the left. And they knew this was an important occasion. That's why they posed for photos being made up as men. Um, you can see how determined Rose is there on the left. And she was successful. And this was the sort of thing that made newspapers um, uh, across the United Kingdom. It was a big deal. Uh, it was a novelty story, of course, but it was a big deal. When Rose finishes her studies at Oxford, she does well, but she doesn't finish with a first. She she, she is a middling student in terms of grades, but she's committed and she's a hard worker and she dives into her studies and, and takes on the really hard topic. She pursued um, uh, politics, philosophy and economics, the PPE, which is a really rigorous course at Oxford. When she's done, uh, she comes to the United States to get her master's degree and she goes to Mount Holyoke. And you can see her in this image and it's really an ironic image because Rose now at 80 years old, um, detest the United States and everything it stands for, but not at that time. You can see she's wearing her cowboy garb, even though she's in, um, <laughs> she's out in uh, Mount Holyoke, and she's got this little red sports car that she had shipped over to the U.S. so she could drive around the country. She actually drove across the country alone to uh, take some courses at Stanford during the break. So she was fully embedded in the whole experience. Um, and then it's interesting that she went to Mount Holyoke because every time I start researching one of these great art theft or art crime stories, I'm always just holding my breath to hear about the connection to Massachusetts because there's always a connection to our Commonwealth and that's it. Rose came to study for her master's degree at Mount Holyoke. That's her passport photo so you can, you can see uh, what she looked like. And then something really uh, 
further interesting happens to Rose that really starts to lead her down the path towards being a, uh, a revolutionary, which is how she viewed herself. After she graduated from Mount Holyoke, she returns to the United Kingdom and studies for her PhD at Bedford College, and she graduates. And she takes a job at the UN and learns about economics in the third world, but goes back and teaches. So she's a professor in the city. And um, now she's, uh, it's, the, it's the mid to late 60s. And she's amongst these college students when protests around the world are burgeoning. And these are things that are starting to make the newspaper, you know, we take them for granted today that it's just a way of life. And especially the idea that there are protests on campuses in the 60s is just something we know some of you experience. But um, this was new at the time. In 1968, Rose had an opportunity and that was Fidel Castro had invited college students from the West to come to Havana to what they, what they call the Cinco de Mayo camps and to see the product of his revolution. And he invited all of these uh, accomplished, well-to-do, um, better known students, undergraduates to come. And I don't have a picture of Rose there, but to give you an example, on the right is Christopher Hitchens in Cuba. And what's interesting to me is that with these 21 and 22 year old students, Rose travels, but she's not that age, she's uh, 27. And as I think most of you would agree, while there's not a big difference between someone who's say 50 and 55, there's a very big difference between someone who's a 27 year old professor and a 22 year old undergrad. Um, but nevertheless, she travels with these students. And while many of these students, including Hitchens are completely underwhelmed by what they see from Castro, uh, they go to his lectures and people are giving standing ovation on cue at appointed times in which the ovations are led by his men. Um, they, they hear Castro talk about how there's no prostitution in one speech. Uh, and then they turn around and see a line of prostitutes behind them. Their passports are taken when they get there. They're not allowed to leave without permission. So they're not impressed, but Rose is greatly impressed, which is such an irony that these younger people don't fall for it, but Rose does. And she really takes to the people and she's enamored with what she sees, so much so that when she comes back to Great Britain from Cuba, she becomes, uh, she returns a changed person. And as an example, she's no longer a professor. She sells her apartment in Chelsea, a very Tony apartment in Chelsea, and decides she's going to open a tenants union in Tottenham, which is a working class area, um, lower working class area. And, Rose uh, decides she's going to work for the people now, and they start calling her the angel of Tottenham because she's so she's such a soft touch with her money and looking for people to help. And many people were taking advantage of her, but I don't think she really even cared. So she opened this storefront on a corner, and what a tenants union would be would do is she would be like an advocate, a social justice type person. And if you weren't getting your benefits from the county or the or the British government she would go to the government offices on your behalf. But she didn't just go as an advocate, she was feared. Civil servants would see her kick in the door, walk in and they would shut her. Uh, and this is right from their mouths, you'll see in the book. Um, she would slam on the tables. In one instance, she overturned the table. So she was a force to be reckoned with. She would help people become squatters in apartments. She was at the very beginning of what would come to be known as direct action in the late 60s and early 70s. And it was during this time that she had the tenants union here in Tottenham that she met a union leader by the name of Walter Keaton. They were at the same protests all the time. It was inevitable that they would meet each other. And Walter was a charismatic guy and Rose was a charismatic gal and they, they hit it off. And within days, they were like Velcro. They were just tied at the, at the hip together everywhere one was, the other was. And they were at every protest. Um, and soon they became enamored also with the cause of Irish Republicanism. And you can see at Rose's tenants union, she put the Irish tricolor above the shop. And again, 
we're looking at this now in the context of 2021. It doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, if you go uh, down to the north end of Boston, you'll see Italian flags all over. Uh, this is a site you might see in, East, in South Boston. But not in Great Britain in, in the, the early 70s uh, did you see this sort of display because in 1969, the Irish Civil Rights Movement had a renaissance and Rose and Walter decided they were going to help from across the sea in Britain. This is Rose and Walter. Uh, he's uh, nine years older than Rose, who just turned 90 in fact. Um, they're at a protest raising their, their clenched fist. This particular protest was, were, uh, was for some uh, black prisoners in a, a prison in California that they felt were being denied their rights. They were just professional uh, agitators. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. This was just what they did. Now, one of the great parts of researching Rose Dugdale's story is, is thinking about the era in which it took place. Now, whenever she would get into trouble, it would be national news and often international news because people would be blown away by this PhD heiress who had given it all up to help the people of Tottenham and was protesting all the time and living amongst the people. And um, journalists, commentators, and later even judges would assume because of the era that she must have fallen under the influence of a man. And in this case, Walter Heaton. And Walter, who I interviewed, will tell you that was not the case. In fact, he fell under her influence and the photos of these two together are so illustrative. So in this one, you can see Rose is taking the lead in the interview with the media. She's the one doing the talking. And just look at the way Walter's looking at her. I mean, he just absolutely adores her. To this day, um, he still speaks so incredibly fondly of her. But one of the problems is that Rose is giving away all of her money. Now, Walter is an avowed socialist and a man of the people, but he... Um, he sort of contradicts his stances and his speeches because he lets Rose spend exorbitant amounts of money on the finest suits of the day for him. So he's always impeccably dressed and drives around in a Mercedes all of a sudden because of Rose's largesse. Um, she gives Walter uh, 10,000 pounds to spend. The two become lovers, um, despite the fact that Walter lives with his wife and daughters. And uh, even though he maintains this domestic um, position, Rose describes them as common law spouses. And it's just a really bizarre free love type of relationship where they're carrying on um, in the most flagrant ways in front of Walter's obviously disapproving wife. Uh, it's tough to read about them and to hear Walter's wife's interviews about of these two would uh, fort in front of her, right, right in front of her and speak in, uh, try to speak in Gaelic so she couldn't understand what they were saying. It's really a bizarre relationship, but it, it was their relationship. Eventually Rose though ran out of money. Money for her father stopped. She couldn't keep up with the demands, um, including uh, just giving money to whoever needed it. And perhaps out of guilt, giving 28,000 pounds, which in the early 1970s, a remarkable amount of money, even today, to Walter's wife. Um, Walter, of course, being very, uh, nobody's fool, um, besides that the bank account that it goes into will require his signature for withdrawal. So he winds up spending most of it. But when they're out of money, they decide they have to take some action to get more. And they turn to the source Rose has known all her life, her family. And Rose and Walter go to Yardy Farm while her parents and siblings are away at the Epsom Derbies uh, for the weekend. And they break in and they steal the father's art collection. They steal uh, a number of antiques and they get away with, with, the, um, with the goods. Now, they're good at going to steal things, but they're not, they don't have a lot of foresight. So when the theft is committed, it doesn't take much for the authorities to figure out who it was. For instance, um, uh, the dogs at the farm and the animals made no sounds during the theft because they all loved Rose already. Uh, the house staff instantly thought it was her. When the police 
inventory would have been stolen. They noticed the only thing left behind was this precious antique that Rose had given her mother. And her bedroom was the only thing that wasn't touched. So not master criminals uh, in terms of getting away with the heist. So they're arrested and they go to um, court and the wheels of justice moved really quickly back then. So this is a telling photo. Again, um, they're, they're just, they, they really do tell a thousand words. Walter had a criminal history. So when he was convicted and when he was even just arrested, he knew this was bad for him. And you can see it on his face. He is um, not happy about their situation, but Rose sees this arrest as sort of her bona fides. You know, people were very skeptical of her for many years, wondering if she was just this rich girl having fun at the, you know, messing around with the poor and the needy and Irish Republicanism. But you can see here, she does not look upset or distressed at all over her plight as opposed to her lover, Walter. And when they go to court, they both um, assume the stances of what the Black Panthers were doing in the United States by using the courtroom, using the docket as their bully pulpit and getting up and giving political speeches. And their most famous uh, quotes, when Walter was sentenced to six years, he said, not since Christ has there been a greater travesty of justice. So you can see Walter's inflated sense of ego there. Uh, and Rose got up and really uh, lambasted her poor parents who were at every day of the trial. And ultimately she said to her father, I love you daddy, but I hate everything you represent. Um, that was essentially her message. Now the judge uh, looked at these two and as I mentioned, gave Walter a, a six to eight year sentence looked at Rose and gave her five years but suspended it and gave her a 5,000 pound fine. And he, he didn't lock her up. And his reason was because he said, it is extremely unlikely that you will ever offend again. And he blamed the influence of Walter on her. Wrongly, of course. And it was an incredibly short-sighted decision on his part. Rose, after the fact, uh, defiant outside the courthouse, loving the the ability to raise her fist to the media and show that she's forthright in her beliefs and the, and the, the struggle will go on. She promises to Walter uh, that she will visit him constantly. Uh, she even um, decides to go to court over a uh, traffic infraction because she knew Walter would have to be there and be out of prison for a day or so so she could see him in person. And for a couple of months, she goes every week. She even protests outside the jail. You can see her sign, free Wally Heaton, the people's friend. Uh, your fear is greater than ours. Um, but then something remarkable happens. Despite her pledges of love and, and loyalty to Walter, just before Christmas in 1973, Rose leaves Great Britain and goes to Ireland and never communicates with Walter again. When she gets to Ireland, she takes up immediately with an IRA soldier by the name of Eddie Gallagher. And Eddie is a really interesting character. He's, unlike Walter, he's much younger than Rose. And um, again, the press would assume that she was under his sway, but it was quite the opposite. Eddie was like Rose in a lot of ways in that he was a truly dedicated radical and he had no time for hierarchies or bosses. Now you can think whatever you wish about the IRA but you can't deny that they were strategic and they had a hierarchy and interestingly Eddie had no intentions of following any strategy or hierarchy so he was he had his own active service unit with a couple of other guys and they would just go out and do radical things um, without permission. And oftentimes it would fly in the face of what the IRA was trying to accomplish, but Eddie really didn't care. And that was music to Rose's ears. And one day, uh, Rose posed as a journalist and approached a helicopter rental company and said she needed to fly over County Wicklow to take some photos for uh, an article she was writing. So the captain was amenable to that. And on the appointed day, she showed up and the captain was at the helicopter and then three other men 
stormed the helicopter uh, at gunpoint and hijacked it. It forced the captain uh, to fly them with these milk churns, these large milk churns that they had packed by hand with explosives. And they ordered the captain to fly above a Royal Ulster Constabulary and where they dropped these bombs. Now they missed their targets, thank God, uh, and they were poor bomb makers. So again, they had an idea and they were able to execute it, but they couldn't succeed at it because they weren't professional bomb makers. So the, the police from the constabulary watched, as they said to the press, an amusement at the futility of the effort by these terrorists. This was the first aerial attack on Great Britain since the Blitz. Um, and when I use the term terrorist, I should say I'm, I'm saying that from the, the perspective of the, uh, the RUC, I don't make any judgment as to whether these people are freedom fighters or terrorists. That's for the reader to decide. Nevertheless, although the police say they, they found amusement in this, this would have been a horrible massacre if it had succeeded. It would have killed hundreds of people. Um, and it would, she would be long remembered as a mass murderer. So she had made up her mind that killing people might be necessary for the revolution that she envisioned now alongside Eddie. The police put up wanted posters for her. They took shots at her in the wanted posters. You can see they mentioned her having a masculine appearance, uh, dirty and untidy um, with a uh, Long, uh, long, fair, and straight hair, but um, sallow eyes. And they're looking for her. The uh, special branch officers are looking for her. They know her aliases, so they're they're hot, hot on her trail. They know that she had been running arms from Great Britain to Ireland, and now she had tried to bomb a police station. Not long before Rose made her move over to Ireland, something really important in the and the troubles happen. The woman on the right is Dolores Price, and on the left is her 18-year-old sister, Marion. Dolores was just over 20. And the two of them were the first female IRA soldiers, and uh, that, that would really take an active role. So there were women helping the IRA, but they would do things like clean bullets and uh, you know, organize the guns and, and uh, support work. But Dolores on the right, had no um, temper for being a subordinate. And she even became the first OC, officer commanding for an operation. And it was her idea that all the bombings in Northern Ireland weren't having the effect on the British people that was necessary. So the idea was to bring the bombs to Great Britain, and they did. And Dolores and her sister and two men, uh, Feeney and Kelly, set off four car bombs in Great Britain. Uh, outside New Scotland Yard at an army barracks, a government office, and most notably, a massive explosion outside of the Old Bailey, the famous courthouse. That was the most successful of the bomb bombings. No one was killed because the IRA gave a heads up uh, that it was coming, but many, many people were maimed and injured. So I would almost liken it to the marathon bombing without death. Uh, many people injured uh, grievously. So. The, uh, these IRA uh, soldiers went immediately to the airport to go home, but someone had ratted on them, what they would call a brass, uh, had told the police to be looking for them, and they were apprehended at the airport. And it wasn't long before they were tried in court and convicted, um, which they expected. However, they were treated differently by the court than their predecessors in the IRA. Instead of being treated as political prisoners, and sent back to Northern Ireland to spend, to, to, to serve their sentence close to home and have certain rights in terms of visits and wardrobe. They were held as criminals in a British prison. And that was um, unacceptable to the four. And led by Dolores, they went on a hunger strike, which made news around the world. And it was a major story to think of these two young girls watching them waste away and then the government having to decide how to handle it and instead of moving them home, decided to force feed them, which I explain in the book is an incredibly grueling process and made them even sicker. Uh, when I was researching force feeding, 
you know, it's something you just hear the expression and you imagine it, but the way it's done is just horrifying. Uh, so the two were, at, well, four, frankly, were dying in prison. It was a, it was a real political uh, football for the British government. Of course, the Republicans wanted them sent home. In April of 1974, in the evening, thieves went to the Kenwood House in Great Britain. They put uh, locks on the outside of the doors to the building so the guards inside couldn't get out. They cut the phone lines and broke a glass window. Well, I didn't say glass window. They broke a window and they um, took one painting. They took this small Vermeer called the guitar player. And as you can see, it's just a breathtaking uh, work uh, in, in pure uh, Vermeer fashion. It just leaves you wondering so many things. Why did he position her that way to the left of the, of the image? It, cutting off her arm. Is there someone else in the room that she's looking at? Um, just a gorgeous painting. If you ever get to see it in person or look at it up close on, online, which doesn't do it any justice, but you can see one of the strings on the guitar vibrating. It's just brilliant. So the thieves take this painting and um, they get away with it. There are, there are no eyewitnesses that will come forward. Uh, and the police are left wondering who took this, this remarkably valuable painting and left behind Rembrandts and all sorts of other works just took this from here. Soon the media um, started receiving uh, tips and ransom demands, but the one that rang true was from people claiming to be sympathizers of uh, Dolores and Marion Price demanding that they be sent to Northern Ireland in return for this painting. And to prove that they actually had it, they cut an edge of the canvas off the tacking, the side of the painting, if you will, the part that you wouldn't, you wouldn't see if it was hanging on the wall. And, and it proved that they actually had the painting. So the police were looking uh, for this and who did it. In April, uh, just about six weeks later, people uh, it, driving a small Ford automobile, drive to the rear of this building. This is the Rossborough House in Ireland. It is just an incredible building. It is billed as the longest building in all, in all of Ireland. And it is uh, so long that it's difficult to get a picture that does it justice and includes the entire thing. If I, if I showed you a panoramic view of this, it would be too small because it's so long. And it's owned at the time by Sir Alfred Byte and his wife Clementine. Uh, and they are heirs to the De Beers' diamond fortune. This home is populated with art that would rival many, many museums, including the Kenwood House. And um, that one evening in April, the house staff are working in their quarters, and uh, that Ford is in the back, and somebody rings the doorbell, and a young son, a 14-year-old son of one of the staff, answers and sees a woman speaking broken French to him and says, her car broke down, can I use your phone? And he says, well, of course. And when he opens the door, three men barge in with her bearing weapons and they subdue him and all of the house staff, lock them in a room and they go directly to the parlor where they find Sir Alfred and Lady Clementine listening to phonographs. This is such an unsettling scene um, for both of them, they think it's a practical joke. And the, the ruffians tell them to get on the floor face down and they, they tie them up and they strike Sir Alfred in the head with a gun and he starts bleeding. And that's when they know this is for real. And they're, they're yelling um, communist slogans at them, calling them capitalist pigs. And this is what you deserve. And the woman drops her French accent and starts to point out to the thugs with her what paintings to take from the walls. And they choose 19 paintings. And of course, the woman is Rose Dugdale. And only Rose amongst the four would have any idea what paintings to take. The three men with her wouldn't know this painting, a uh, lady writing a letter with her maid, from a, you know, a, a paint by numbers work somewhere. They, they just were not exposed to fine arts. 
Rose was. Her mother dabbled in art, worked at a gallery, and of course, Rose was highly educated and even chose art for one of the houses at Hoxford. She knew what to take. And when you read the list of 19 pieces, first of all, I can't even remember them all, but I can tell you, obviously, a Vermeer, the crown jewel of any collection, they took um, two Gainsboroughs, uh, two Rubens, they took um, Velazquez, just works by artists that you see at the top of the bill for any um, highly esteemed museum. And again, only Rose would know these. Now, this is the Vermeer. And again, like I said about the, uh, the guitar player, you just see the mystery of this painting. You can stare it for hours and wonder uh, what the woman's writing because you see that chair at the table is moved aside, making you wonder if some, someone, maybe a man, had been seated there and maybe they had a dispute because on the floor you see a crumbled up letter. Um, did she receive mail uh, that upset her? Is she writing an angry response or a loving response or an apology? That's left for us to decide because we know so little about Vermeer's works except for their majesty. So they, they make a getaway. They, they, oh, that, sorry, they even took a Goya, the Goya beneath which Sir Alfred had proposed to Lady Clementine. And about a half hour after the thieves leave, one of the house staff gets loose. They call the police and they call doctors, of course, and the guard had come. And one of my favorite moments is when the guard a detective gets there. He calls um, headquarters and says, there's probably a million dollars worth of art stolen, which is a vast understatement. And his boss says to him, scoffs at him and says, there's not a million dollars worth of art in all of Ireland. Um, little did they know what was in this house, but Rose Dugdale would know. This is a, a crime scene photo. Um, you know, it reminds me of my own images from the God. When you see these empty frames, it's not uncommon. It's very common for thieves to leave empty frames behind just because of the fact that they're cumbersome. Rose and her associates flee. They uh, use a series of stolen cars that they, that they leave um, in uh, thinly populated areas. That's part of their plan. Rose, um, doesn't understand Ireland. She thinks by going and hiding out in the countryside of West Cork that she would never be found. Where, whereas the fact is the people there would notice an outsider in a second and they recognized her and, and when the police um, were asking questions, the homeowner that she rented from instantly recognized, oh yes, I have that woman here. So she's arrested and here she is being driven away and again, She's establishing her bona fides as a radical. This is someone who took direct action. Her demands were like, uh, were like the ones for the guitar player, moved the Price sisters to Northern Ireland. Interestingly, Dolores Price sent word through her father to the media that she did not want anyone to steal Vermeer's and she did not want to be moved because of these stolen paintings. She loved art and felt that she, she should be moved on her merits, not as ransom for some paintings. Rose uh, is, is, of course, brought before the court, not just for this massive theft, but also for the helicopter episode. Fortunately for her, the sentences uh, ran consecutively, I'm sorry, concurrently. Uh, so she received nine years in prison, served about eight. But this was her moment. This was her opportunity to get in front of the courtroom again and, and have the media in front of her, have her parents there, have the British establishment hear her railing against the, um, the activities of the British government against the uh, Irish Catholics of Northern Ireland. And she said when asked if she was, how she pled uh, by the judge, she famously replied, proudly and incorruptibly guilty. So she went to prison, of course. She couldn't uh, stop making headlines there. She became the first woman to give birth to a child in an Irish prison, because when she got there, she noticed she was feeling a little different and um, snuck out a uh, little jar for urine to her lawyer, determined she was pregnant. 
caused all kinds of consternation for the Irish government. They were not allowed, uh, not about to allow her to go to a hospital. So they set up a, a makeshift delivery room in the prison. Uh, that's her son, Rory, who actually lived in the prison for a number of weeks. And then Eddie makes a dramatic return, which I will not tell you about. You will not believe it when you read it. Um, I, I'll, you'll have to buy the book to learn what Eddie did when his wife was in prison. It's just, it, it's one of these stories where many people know, know Rose Dugdale just because of what Eddie did after she gave birth. Today, Rose is fully accepted by uh, Irish Republicans. So in her day, people were skeptical of her. When she was on the run, there were um, Republican safe houses that were uh, hesitant to to house her because they weren't sure if she was just going through a phase uh, and having fun at their expense. Um, but after she went to prison and she emerged, that people and she went right to work for Sinn Fein, people realized that she was the real deal. And today she's celebrated by Republicans and has lived in Dublin ever since. And you can see on the right, um, when Fidel Castro died, she was pushed in her wheelchair to the consulate where she signed the regrets book for Fidel Castro, sort of uh, where it all began. At the end of Dolores Price's life, which uh, ended sadly at the early age of 63, she was dismayed with Jerry Adams and the way the IRA had entered into the Good Friday Accords and in, in the the peace accords that they accepted. She didn't feel that that's what she was fighting for. But Rose uh, is fully accepted. And here she is with Jerry Adams at a parade. And it's just an interesting intersection between the two. Uh, one was the real deal from Northern Ireland. The other was a rich heiress from uh, Devon. And in the end, it's the woman from Devon who uh, is celebrated. And today, sadly, Dolores Price is gone. So that's a synopsis of The Woman Who Stole Vermeer. I hope I've told you a story that begs for you to read more. I think you will be absolutely blown away by the book about Rose's experiences. And, you know, you can judge her however you wish, but you cannot walk away from it thinking she was anything less than a fully committed revolutionary. That doesn't mean you have to agree with what she tried to do, but it does mean that um, she was the real deal. She was not, she was not Patty Hearst, who whose affair happened at the same time. Patty Hearst uh, was kidnapped, Rose ran towards her problems. Patty Hearst fell in love with the man who influenced her. Rose was influencing the men. And Patty Hearst was on trial. She pled not guilty and had Ethel Bailey as a lawyer, whereas Rose pled proudly and incorruptibly guilty, defended herself, and used it for a political statement. Um, it's just a remarkable story. I thank you so much for joining me tonight. I'm more than happy to answer questions that you may have. And um, I'm, I have, uh, an, my ego is not so big that I don't realize you might have got, uh, questions about the God or not just my book. And if you do, I'll answer those to the extent possible. But thank you again. So a uh, wonderful job, Anthony, as expected. Uh, we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questions. If folks have any questions for Anthony, you can type them into the Q&A or the chat and uh, we'll make sure to answer them. Uh, Anthony, um, several questions about what happened to the painting. So the paintings were all recovered when the police arrested Rose Dugdale, the 18 of the 19 paintings were in the boot of her car. Um, the men all fled. She was the only one that was arrested, the only person to be convicted. I named the other three men in the book. Um, but Rose accepted her fate. I think she was uh, res uh, resigned to the fact that she had to go to prison for this. But the paintings were all recovered in good condition. Uh, nowadays, because the Rustboro house was robbed, believe it or not, three more times, um, the, the most valuable of the paintings are at the National Gallery in Dublin. 
Great. Um, let's see. Diane wants to know what happened to Walter Heaton and did Rose ever reconcile with her parents? Uh, also, where is her son Rory today? Outstanding question. So Walter's alive and well. He's in Britain when he was released. Rose only contacted him one other time to let her know she had a baby. And that really crushed Walter because when you look at the timing, um, she uh, gave birth to the child. Um, she must have consummated a relationship with Eddie rather quickly rather, uh, after leaving Walter. Um, but he's alive and well, and he speaks fondly of her now. And it's really interesting because he's, when I spoke to him, he asked for questions in writing uh, just because of his age and his wife would handle uh, typing for him. He's very robust, but he's not computer savvy. So when I asked him what his memories of the Rose were, how would he describe her? He said um, he called her uh, revolutionary, and he used some more, I wish I could remember the exact words, but described her basically as like a, something to the effect of like a ferocious lover, which I thought would be, was an interesting thing to tell his current wife. Um, but Walter is a, a, a complex guy and I tell his story in the book and I think you'll, you'll get to understand him a bit better. Rory, uh, I've spoken to, he's a, a tremendous uh, young man. Um, I really enjoy talking to him. He's perfectly normal. He's not in any trouble. Uh, he's incredibly likable. So Rory's alive and well and um, living a good life. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, were Americans less familiar with this theft due to the similar timing of Patty Hearst? Uh, that could be one, one part of it. I think the greater part of it is that Americans are terribly uninterested in uh, international news. Um, so I don't think people were that interested in what was happening over at the Rossboro house with this woman from Devon. That's just not something Americans really care much about. However, it was, it was in all the newspapers. I mean, it was in Time Magazine. It, it got major attention here, but it didn't stick. And you're probably right. Uh, Patty Hearst was much more interesting and closer to home for the American sensibility. Uh, so Marie and Catherine have similar questions. Uh, they wanna know, is Rose a suspect in the paintings stolen and as yet to be recovered from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum? So let's connect the two things, Anthony, what do you say? Well, Catherine, um, you didn't have to put that thing in parentheses about yet to be recovered. That's <laughs> it. That stings a little, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, no, she's absolutely not a suspect. She never returned to the United States, nor could she. She wouldn't be admissible into the country, given her criminal history. Um, absolutely not a suspect. Uh, no, uh, the thieves were men, but even in terms of plotting it. In fact, it's, you know, it's a good um, segue, though, because a lot of times you'll hear these stories pop up in the press. Oh, every 18 months or so that the IRA was involved in our theft. But um, it's incredibly unlikely, incredibly unlikely that the IRA had anything to do with that theft. But Catherine, if Rose really was a suspect, would Anthony actually tell us? So think about that. Uh, <laughs> Diane, uh, Diane had a four-part question. We missed one of her questions. Um, did Rose ever reconcile with her family? Uh, thanks for being persistent with that, Diane. That's such a great question. Um, that's one of my favorite parts of the story. Her father and mother were just dragged through the press. They were humiliated in open court and they never gave up on their daughter. And again, as a father of daughters, I understand it. And it really uh, hit me how both of them never gave up on her. They, they would say how disappointed they were in her, but um, in fact, they, they, when they passed away, she got an equal share of their inheritance with their other children. Um, when Rose went to prison, the mother would send gifts for uh, Rose's son um, and would visit him at the uh, perfect segue to Patricia's question. So uh, when they could no longer keep Rory at the prison and he was no longer being um, uh, nursed by his mother, he was sent to a, a family that were Republican sympathizers in Ireland that were willing to take him in. And there's wonderful people that knew Eddie Gallagher, cared for Rory. Um, 
and Rose's parents would send clothes and money and support to, for little Rory there. And again, never gave up on their daughter and always tried throughout their lives to be parents to their radical daughter. It's just, it's really a touching story. You know, I, I, I'm a father, so it appealed to me in a way that it might not have if I had written this book when I was uh, in my early 20s. Uh, Anthony, a question from the chat. Uh, how did you get started in your line of work as an art depth investigator? It's a bizarre line of work, isn't it? Um, it's one of those things in life that uh, <laughs> it's hard to, you know, I think about it all the time. So I, I spent the first 15 years of my career working for the government, uh, basically homeland security type positions. I was with uh, former immigration service and I was a special agent um, for the FAA security branch. After 9-11, I was assistant federal security director working to rebuild Logan. Um, cannot believe at all that we're coming up on the 20th anniversary. Um, and then after I, fit, I felt that I had finished everything I had hoped to accomplish with Homeland Security, I saw the job posting for the Gardner and uh, believe it or not, it's a unique experience to be a security person and an investigator. You're usually one or the other. And I just happen to be both. And the Gardner Museum just happened to be the one museum in the world that needed both. Uh, so, you know, just like many of you have gone there, hopefully all of you, uh, you go into the place, you can't believe your eyes, and you hear that you can go there to work every day. And it's hard. It's a hard offer to turn down. That being said, 16 years ago when I was in my 30s looking for the paintings, I would never imagine I'd be 54 sitting here talking to you about art theft and still looking for our stolen art. But it's the sort of art and the sort of legacy of Mrs. Godner that, we, that, that keeps you working towards it and makes you understand that you can never give up and you will always do everything you can to get the art theft. And so, Anthony, last question uh, for me. Uh, uh, when you do find the art, do you plan on writing a book? And will you come to Tewksbury to talk about it? Well, Robert, you know, that's such a great question because the easy answer would be yes. But I have to be pragmatic and say, first of all, thank you for your optimism. I love that. We will find this art. I do believe, however, that in order to find it, there will be parts of the story that can never be told. So it would be a challenge to write a book about it. There's so many, in 16 years, I there's so many confidences that I will never break because people are afraid to talk about the people involved in this heist. And I can never even hint towards breaking them. And other people who've written about the Gardner have, um, and I won't name names, but they have, and I will never do that. So. I would like to think I will write a book about the eventual recovery, but I think it would be a very difficult book to write. Um, if I do, I would write it with the FBI agent that I work with, Jeff Kelly, because we're that close and we've worked together for so long. Um, I think the story would, would be best told by both of us. But again, I don't know how it could ever be told without jeopardizing people's confidences. Understood, understood. So uh, we're coming up on the eight o'clock hour. Uh, you've answered about 10 questions. That's uh, good enough for me. Um, Anthony, did you wanna have uh, say any last words to the group uh, before we wrap up? Yes, well, a couple first. I can't thank you enough for spending some of your evening with me. Um, thank you, Patricia, for those words. I think it'd be an interesting book. Um, I'll answer that last one. Why just for Vermeer? Because Vermeer is the crown jewel and Vermeer was stolen twice. Um, and I believe I make the case in the book that I think you should read and you enjoy it if you're into investigations, but why I believe she stole the guitar player as well. But for a woman to steal art is incredible. For a woman to steal Vermeer is mind blowing. For a woman to be involved in two Vermeer thefts is, my, you should see my head exploding on the screen right now. So uh, I want to thank you very much. I will say an interesting thing, the paperback comes out in a couple of weeks, but in the weird algorithm of pricing on Amazon, right now the hardcover, I think it's actually cheaper than pre-ordering the paperback. So if you're going to buy the book, now's the time. 
um, to pick it up in whatever fashion you like. And it's available as an audio book as well. And I chose a female British reader because I thought it should be in Rose's voice, not in a man's voice. So it's a great uh, read as well. So thank you very much. And Robert, again, thank you for thinking of me and, and allowing me to talk to your, your, um, your, your guests. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Anthony. And I want to thank Walter in the chat for informing me, for educating me about the importance of Wilbraham, uh, which is where Friendly's Ice Cream uh, was founded. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the libraries in Andover, Boxford, Chumsford, Drake, at Merrimack, North Andover, Norwood, Raleigh, Tingsboro, West Newberry, Wilmington, and yes, Wilbraham uh, for sponsoring uh, tonight's event. I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, a reminder to check your email tomorrow morning. Uh, look for that feedback survey and uh, look for the link to this recording and feel free to share it with anyone who uh, you uh, think might be interested. So thank you so much, Anthony, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Good luck with the search, Anthony. Thank you. All right. Bye, bye all. <laughs>